I'm grateful to have Kristen Toscano today with me on the call. Kristen is a human design coach. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry. I didn't either. And Kristen will let us know. Kristen, what have you done so far today for your health and performance? Thanks, Nick. Really excited to be here. Um, I guess one of the things that I do pretty consistently is a embodiment practice. It's like a moving meditation um, and it correlates with the chakra systems and really brings intention to my day. Very cool. That's a new one for me. So what's your background? Yeah. How did you get here? How did you get interested in the chakras and this whole side of things that you're about to ex explain? Sure. So I was a physical therapist for 20 years, really working in clinical healthcare and outpatient orthopedics and sports medicine, primarily. And went to work in a clinic that was doing PT driven wellness, shifted into more of the health coaching side of things, but found that my passion was talking to my patients and my clients about what was going on beneath the surface that was leading to the manifestations of pain and stress. Um, you know, the stressors that were under, underlying what was bringing them to see me in the first place. And as I explored kind of more the spiritual energetic world myself personally, I got a lot of value from it and realized I could do a lot more to help my clients and patients before they hit this like bottom point that was bringing them with all this pain um, into the clinic. Yeah, we tend to think that pain is a result of an acute injury. There's one instance, okay, I did this and got injured and now I have back pain. But I heard a stat recently that actually 70% of pain doesn't have a specific memorable incident. Yeah, I find that to be true in my experience in the PT clinic. I also found, you know, I saw so many patients with neck and shoulder problems that were, were stress related. Um, and I saw a statistic that at least 80% of doctor visits are due to stress. Um, so there's, yeah, and there's uh, things that we can address stress and burnout wise, um, from a, from a little different perspective before we get to the point of like physical breakdown. When I first heard about quantum human design and human design in general, I was apprehensive The whenever I see the word quantum, it throws up a red flag and makes me wonder about it. And then after talking to you, getting to know you and your work and where it comes from. I realized there's a lot more here than I initially suspected. So walk us through a little bit about what human design is and what that quantum element is. Sure, sure. So human design, it was received by this guy, Ra, in 1987, over eight days and eight nights. The whole system, he heard this voice and created this whole system, which, yeah, sounds a little bizarre. <laughs> But when you look at it, it really pulls in a lot of ancient wisdoms. It's a synthesis of astrology, the Chinese I Ching, the Hindu chakra systems, the Judaic Kabbalah, and quantum mechanics. And it really gives us like a blueprint of our energy and how like the themes we're here to explore energetically, how we relate to the world around us. Um, and how we kind of write the story of who we are or kind of express the story of who we are. What is energy and the chakras or energy centers as they're often called in your interpretation? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I find that there are themes that we express, you know, ways we create, ways we process information, um, things that, that we feel, even though you don't necessarily see them. And I think, you know, if you go back to, we're in this shift of consciousness from more of like a Newtonian physics, where we look at things in finite, measurable, um, kind of a little bit reactive, but like we have to prove things and we're shifting more into a consciousness of kind of unlimited possibilities. And, and the science is starting to back that stuff up. 
Um, when we look at human design, and I study with Karen Curry Parker, who has shifted the language of human design to speak more to the potential in the chart. When Ra received this system, it was really meant to shock people into awakening. Hmm. And so Karen, through understanding of the importance of language, has written like the awakened version uh, okay. Because Ra passed in 2011 before he had the opportunity to, and she was one of his students. Um, but when we look at the body graph and understand the mechanics of energy, we can see how like our thoughts calibrate our emotions, which calibrate our uh, magnetic monopole that lives in the identity center and attracts things to us for us to respond to. Okay, so Ra conceived it, and then Karen took the torch and ran with it, and you studied under Karen. Yes, yeah. There's been a lot of different um, schools of human design or kind of things that have come out of it. Uh, Jovian Archive is still runs like the traditional human design part of it. Um, Karen has this quantum perspective. Uh, if anyone's heard of Gene Keys with Richard Rudd, that's another kind of take off on human design. So it's kind of grown to have these schools kind of uh, branch off from the original system. Okay. And what's the point? I know, you, I know you mentioned that it helps us live in energetic alignment, but like, what does that look like in my everyday if I'm living in energetic alignment? Yeah, so I think of human design as like the ultimate personality test. You know, instead of like Myers Briggs or some of these other disc or strength finders where you're answering questions, and I always wondered, am I answering these based on how I really am or how I think I'm supposed to be? Because I lived in the shoulds for a long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is based on your birth information, it's the date, time, and location that you were born. But when we take a look at it, it gives us information into how do we make decisions that are right for us, um, that we can trust. And that was a big thing. Like it really helped me, like I said, get out of the shoulds or what I was thought people expected to, of me and really trust what I knew deep within myself. Um, one of the biggest things I hear from clients is like, gosh, that is really validating. I always felt this thing about myself, but I didn't trust it. Hmm. I know that when I first took the Myers-Briggs test, I got certain results and then I took it again a few months later and it changed. And while that was frustrating, I also recognized that my personality changes over time. And how does human design incorporate that? How does it incorporate the fact that as we grow and evolve personally, our personality is changing? Yeah, so because we're talking about archetypes within human design, there are like high expressions of these energetic themes, low expressions, and kind of everything in between. And so as you start to understand the themes that you are going to experience consistently over your lifetime, because they're part of your soul curriculum, then you get choice in how you want to express those energies. Yeah, and also when I took the... Clifton Strengths Finder. I had the same thing where it's like I answered A, but I could have easily said B or C, maybe D. So, am I even making this test accurate, or am I completely throwing off the results? Yeah, and I think there's definitely value in those tests that do give you a gauge of where you at are at in this moment. Um, I recently did a certification on a personality assessment, and I'm currently exploring if we can use those assessments as like a lens to see hmm. how your conditioning is maybe showing up or how it's being expressed, which is like, um, where, you know, where are you living based on the meanings that you've created based on your interactions with the world around you that aren't necessarily true to who you really are. I like that. So human design was like your baseline. And then you can use the other tests as snapshots into where you are currently and where you can go you can regress or progress yeah exactly and how did you come up with that idea um i i was on a networking call and someone told me about this assessment that they were playing with and 
Um, I said, yeah, sure. I'm curious. Let me know. I'll check it out. And uh, they were doing a beta test of, of the training. So um, yeah, it's something I'm exploring now as I go through and finish up that certification and with some of my human design clients, just seeing like, is there a correlation? And there seems to be. Hmm. While I was doing my homework for this episode, I was doing some additional research into human design and I found some videos talking about how human design can help you like, lean into the right kinds of pain and avoid the wrong kinds of pain and live more authentically. Can you explain some of the, the benefits uh, across like, life's different domains of learning about human design and building your life around your unique blueprint? Sure, sure. So when I look at the human design body graph, um, there's several different layers that we're looking at and, and kind of the top layer we look at is called type. And what I really love about type is it gives you insights into the role that you're here to play as well as how you make decisions that are right for you. And that's one layer. Then there's a lot of other layers that we can dive into. And I know we'll d d dive into type a little bit more in a few minutes. But some of the other things we can look at are if we look at the individual centers and whether you have consistent access to those energies or um, if there are things that you experience more in your relationships, that can give us insights into how your energy works. And I really like to look at it too from a burnout perspective of like, if you're living in alignment with your design and things feel good, because that's ultimately what we're looking at is we're shifting from functioning from a place of fear and instinct and intuition and being reactive to shifting into more things feeling good, more of sense of well-being, um, being more deliberate and having more choice. And how do you feel about the concept of like the obstacle being the way or the only way forward is to push through, to fight, to suffer and eventually triumph? When you're living in alignment with your design, it's not that things are always necessarily going to be easy, but there's this inner sense that things are right. In quotation marks, it's like, like you're on like things that you can kind of feel them, see the meaning behind it. Um, for example, in the graph, there, there's even a channel for struggle. But the high expression of that is really being able to find the meaning and the wisdom into knowing what's worth fighting for. So being connected to kind of the higher purpose. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're going to experience struggle. It's not all going to be easy. But there's that, that underlying sense of even though it's challenging, there's something here for me. Mm. Yeah, the worst part is when you're struggling, you're really pushing forward. And at the same time, you have that voice in the back of your head doubting, should I be doing this? Is this the right thing? Should I wait and try this later? And I, I guess what it sounds like you're saying is that human design can help you quiet that voice of wondering and tell you, inform you that it is the actual right path. Yeah, I think there's some value in that awareness that like that's energetically that's going to happen. Um, you know, our when we look at the chart, the head center, the head center is full of questions. So it's questioning how, it's questioning why, it's questioning can I prove it. Um, the problem is we tend to turn those questions in on ourselves and then judge ourselves by them mm -hmm. rather than turning those questions out to the universe seeing what shows up in our outer reality for us to respond to that's going to guide us to to the right things. Yeah. By now we've talked a bit about the the why why people should pay attention to this and we've also talked about some of the terminology like you, you mentioned channels a minute ago also the body graph how mm -hmm. does this all look? Yeah, so I know we're on video. I know it's also going to be a podcast, but um, when I'm going to share my screen here for those watching the video, and I'll try and describe it for those who just have the audio right now. Um, so what we're looking at here is a 
series of shapes, which are called centers, and they correlate with the chakras. Um, but instead of there being seven, there's nine centers. Those have energies like the head center is like the center for ideas and inspiration. The throat center is communication and manifestation. Um, the sacral center has to do with consistent life force, um, workforce energy. And so they, they carry different themes. Then between all of these shapes, there's lines. And those are the channels. Within each channel, there's two gates. And the gates are represented by numbers of the I Ching on the shapes. And what people will notice when they look at a body graph is some things are colored in and some things are white. Where things are colored in, we call that defined. And those are consistent themes. It's part of your soul curriculum. And where things are white, those are energies that you're going to explore more in relationships because you're going to take in the energy of the people around you and amplify them. And so those are that's how you're going to explore those energies. And it's going to be in a more variable way, depending on who's around or where the planets are transiting. Hmm. As I see it, there's shapes throughout the body, different, they correspond to the nine chakra centers and the channels are lines connecting the different parts. And then there's numbers as she just explained, and it's pretty complex. It makes sense to see the visual. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll see some like red lines and black lines and line of numbers with planetary symbols in black on the right side. That is based on the time of your birth. That is your soul curriculum. It's the themes that you're here to explore energetically based on where the planets were when you were born. And then on the right side is a bunch of numbers and planetary symbols in red. That's based on about three months before you were born. And that carries more of your epigenetics, your ancestral lineage. It's more of the life story part of your design. And it's it's all about how those two dance together. Unique combination. And then on the left-hand side, we see some, some text, some mm -hmm. categories. What are those? Yeah, so that is, um, the first one you'll see is type. And we talked about that. And, and I'll kind of just go through those five types uh, because that really is the first layer, very practical kind of layer that we look at. And so type, gives us the role that you're here to play. And so there are five types. The first one, which are about 9% of the population are called um, manifestors in traditional human design. And they're here to get things going. They're like, if you think of a theater production, they are like the, pro the producer. They get the idea, the spark of inspiration, and the pulse that like, okay, now's the time to move into action. But they don't have that sustainable workforce, life force energy to be able to create it themselves. So they need to kind of delegate that part. Then you have orchestrators who are, or in traditional human design, they're called projectors. And they are like the director. They hold the template for what's possible. They see the potential, they see the potential roadblocks, and they're here to guide us into taking this idea and putting it into form. Then you have alchemists or generators and time benders, which are known as manifesting generators in traditional human design. They both have that consistent workforce, life force energy. And so they're really here to take that idea and put it into form. So they're the cast and the crew of the theater production. There's a subtle difference between them because the manifesting generators have a little bit of that manifestor energy where they have that internal nonverbal creative flow that they have to follow. Um, and, and part of their purpose is to figure out what steps we can skip along the way of building things. <laughs> and then we also have the reflectors or they're called calibrators they are like the audience and they're only about one percent of the population 
And so they're really here to reflect back to us how we're doing. They're but only 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is, especially like in business, like a lot of us are taught like marketing, like you have to make things happen. You're just supposed to go out and, you know, and do it. Um, and it's taught in a way that really speaks to manifester energy. You know, you get this idea and you just go move into action on it. Well, 90% of us don't work that way. The other thing I really find leads people to burnout is 70% of us have that sacral motor where we have access to that consistent workforce, life force energy. Like we're here to be the doers and the builders. 30% of the population are not, but we're conditioned into work a nine to five, push, 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 you know, always be doing something. And so that doesn't work for people for certain types. So understanding your energy really can give you insights into kind of some of those pieces as well. And help you prevent burnout. Absolutely. Lean into your strengths even, and prevent burnout. Absolutely. Because even if you're a type that has that sacral definition to be able to work and consistently, if you're not work doing the right work, if you're not following the things that light you up, that can lead to burnout too. And of the other items on the, the chart, are there any mm -hmm. other important things to cover? Yeah, I mean, they're all, I mean, they all give us a part of the story, right? So inner authority, that flavors how you make decisions. Um, so as a, so just if I look at your type as an example, as a time bender or manifesting generator, how you know to, what to move into is you'll get this gut level, uh-huh, uh-uh, feeling. Does that resonate? Yeah, I can confirm that's accurate. And when I listen to my gut over my brain, the decisions always end up better. And I let my brain override my gut. I generally look back with dissatisfaction over my choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. None of us are really meant to make decisions from our head. We all have a strategy, which you'll see on here, that corresponds to our type. So, for example, manifestors, you know, they get that pulse. And when the time is right, they'll get this feeling that, like, now is the time to move into action on it and, like, to initiate others. And for them, it's all about informing. They have to, because they're so powerful they have to let the people know who are gonna be influenced what they're doing. So for them, their strategy is to inform. For projectors, their strategy is to wait for the invitation because for them, they really need their value to be seen and recognized because if they're just guide, trying to guide people who aren't ready to be guided, <laughs> There's usually some tension there. It doesn't always go very well, but it doesn't mean they sit around doing nothing in the meantime. They're still meant to follow the things that excite them. But when it comes to guiding and the big decisions, where to live, who to be in relationship with, what kind of work to do, um, and like I said, who to guide, especially, there needs to be that either, either that literal invitation or it can be an energetic thing. So like who's leaning in saying, mm, I really wanna know what you have to say about this thing. For generators and manifesting generators, it's what's showing up in your outer reality that your body is saying, yes, this is something that I'm meant to follow. That feels like a hell yes. I like that. And then for calibrators or reflectors, they have an interesting strategy because they're, in their design, all of their centers are white or open. So they're taking in all of the energy of the people around them. That's why they can reflect oh. back to us how we're doing. They need to wait a lunar cycle to really get clear on their decisions because they need to hear as they're reflecting off all these people around them over the course of that month and really see what stays consistent for and true for them. So they make decisions very slowly. 
more slowly than some of the other types for sure. Especially, like I said, it's really the big decisions, where to live, who to be in relationship, what kind of work to do, um, that, that you really want to make sure you give yourself that time hmm. as a reflector. Yeah. Actually, one of my business accountability buddies is a reflector. And it's been interesting because she lived in a house full of generators her whole life. So she, and she was working in corporate for a long time. So she really was working as a generator type, always doing, doing, doing. And it's been interesting to see her kind of take a step back, really gauge what's going on around her. And really she's a mindfulness leadership coach. But this past year, she really has shifted more into mindful leadership through the lens of DEI, which makes sense because that's kind of the moment we're in. And so she's able to step into that role of reflecting back to us kind of how, how we're doing and where we need to go. Yeah. And in, in our previous conversation, you walked me through the intricacies of my chart. And from mm -hmm. that conversation, that was what made me realize that, oh, this isn't just some made up chart with numbers and colors and lines and shapes. A lot of the things you said seemed oddly specific to my life and they couldn't be generalized to the entire population. It didn't feel like it was one of those like card readings where I'm being cold read to see how I respond. And if I respond in a certain way, then that line of questioning deepens. It seemed like it was just out of left field and things actually really struck home from this chart. Can we go through a couple of them? Sure, sure. I know. Um, so if we stay on type as a manifesting generator, you have a stair step learning process. And, and really the role of the manifesting generator and the generator are, is to become masterful because we are the builders and the doers. So with that stair step learning curve, there's these plateaus where we get frustrated. And I say we, cause I'm also a manifesting generator. <laughs> um, but on these plateaus, when we get frustrated, there's a lot of pressure we can feel to want to quit, but that frustration, when we can kind of shift how we look at it as a, that's an indication we're building the energy to make for us to make that next leap in mastery. If we keep quitting, we never become masterful. So under, like I said, shifting your perspective on that, for what that frustration means is really helpful. Yeah. And I found that I've put myself through competitive sports so that I build that discipline to keep going when things get tough, because often right as I want to quit, just on the other side of that is when I actually see lots of progress. Mm -hmm. Our earlier conversation, we were talking about relationships and emotions and I don't remember the specifics, but I remember something you mentioned. I don't know if it was one of my gates or hanging gates or what it was, but that really surprised me. Yeah, I think it was when we were talking about this gate 19, which is the earth placement on your life story side. And the gate 19 is, is like the archetype of being highly sensitive. Um, and I think that combined with you have this emotional solar plexus center open, which is the archetype of like the emotional empath. And so you can really feel the emotions of the people around you. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. And, and as we were talking, I remember, I'll let you kind of share your experience with that. It's something I've picked up on more recently as I've become more open to the idea of feeling and expressing emotion. It's a pattern that's come up in my relationships, especially recently, about feeling emotion and whether or not I should take on that emotion. It's become a, an idea that I've pondered heavily. Yeah, yeah. And so feelings live throughout the chart. For example, um, like love lives in this identity center. And, and like I said, different emotions live kind of in different spaces. I remember also when we were talking about being highly sensitive, you said, can you shut that down? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's definitely, absolutely. Because if you're feeling it's on an open center, so you're going to feel that energy 
in an amplified way, also with the emotional solar plexus center open, you're going to feel that energy in an amplified way. And so it can be intense. And so particularly, I would say, you know, in as we're younger and we haven't explored what that is yet, we can want to shut that down because it, it does have some intensity with it. That was my long standing pattern of always shutting it down until I'd say the last year I've been more receptive to it. Yeah. And, and part of where we're open and we get to experience these energies in a more variable way, that's where we gain a lot of wisdom. So as you gain wisdom, you learn that like, you don't have to take in these emotions and identify them as your own. You can be a screen rather than a sponge. Mm. Important distinction. Yeah. Okay. And what are some of the other results that clients have experienced from working with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been really um, interesting. I've worked with several moms with young kids who are trying to, you know, build businesses or work full time while also raising small kids, being a wife and having all of these things pull at them. And so really understanding how their energy works and, and where they need to ask for help hmm. is one area. Um, I've also worked with clients who are business owners, who are trying to make decisions, getting distracted by shiny object syndrome, <laughs> you know, not knowing which, which marketing strategy is best for them. Yeah, I'm guilty or, of that myself. Yeah. And so really being able to tap into, well, what feels good to you? And if like, if you have that sacral definition, I can ask you yes, no questions and you can get a lot of clarity in a short period of time. I had a client recently who had been spinning her wheels, trying to figure out this membership offering she was going to have. And in 30 minutes of just yes, no questions and us really getting clear through the lens of her design, she was able to figure out her three offerings, what they were going to cost, how many people were going to be in each of them, when they were going to start, what was her fast acting bonus going to be all in a half an hour. And she's like, I've been spinning my wheels on this for months. And so when someone works with you, they, they get this, you interpret it for them because it's far too complicated for your average person look at glance at and have an idea of what they're looking at. And then how does it work after that? So I have three different ways that I work with clients. One is like, if you're just want to kind of dip your toe and are curious about it um, and want to understand a little bit more about yourself, I do do readings that are just like one session. Then I have a small group program where I'll work with about six or eight people at a time. Over a period of about eight weeks, we kind of go layer by layer. And the magic really happens when you go out into the world and explore mm -hmm. and play. And I like to not take it too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how can we play with like that gut response? Yes, it's really important for the big decisions, but how can you tap into what that feels like when you're figuring out what to have for lunch or what color shirt you're gonna buy at the store? And so we play with the different energies and then we come back and share our experiences. And it's been really cool to see as people come in to the group with different designs, what is the experience of a manifester like as opposed to the experience of a reflector? Hmm. Um, so it's really interesting to see how we understand the people around us better as we also learn to understand ourselves a bit more. That's cool. And I love the idea of optimizing your day's micro decisions as well as the big ones. Yes, it's I find it so helpful with decision fatigue because we you know, how many times do you go through the whole day and you get to the point where it's like, OK, now we got to decide what to have to, for dinner and you all sit around. And go, I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want? And so <laughs> you can even tap into your strategy for that, you know, for those decisions. You know, if you have a sacred response, do you, if I ask you, do you want Italian food or Chinese food tonight? Your, your gut's not going to give you that answer. You're going to be like, I don't know. But if I say, do you want Italian food? You can give me a uh-huh, uh-uh without having to think about it. Oh, okay. 
just the one last way I work with people is through one-on-one coaching. And that's where we kind of dive real deep into the layers of the chart, depending on what you specifically want to get more clarity on, whether it's relationships, business, how, you know, how to get out of burnout or avoid it. Um, if you feel like you're kind of spiraling down that, um, Mm. that path. And so that's usually over like a three month period. And we really dive into the layers and, and really shift the narrative and the meanings that you have about yourself into a more empowering um, perspective. Yeah. And I've found from working with people too, that the mindset shift is often the biggest, most impactful thing you can do better than supplements and routines a lot of times it's like once you get your mind right then the other stuff follows and is much more impactful Mm -hmm. yeah well Kristen, we're running low on time i have a few more questions for you but if someone's interested in connecting or working with you directly how can they get a hold of you on my website kristentoscano.com um also if people want to get their charts there's a spot on there as well for them to send me their birth information what I'll do is I'll pull the chart and email it to them with a PDF that'll give them some more information on what the heck it is that they're looking at, um, as well as some more specifics to their type. Um, and I'm also on Instagram at Kristen Toscano. So those are probably the two best places. Okay, on to the rapid fire round. These are all going to be short on my end, but your response can be as long as you like. Okay. So imagine that there's a burning of the books and all knowledge on earth is gone. You get to save three most impactful books, podcasts, YouTubes, lectures, you name it, but only three pieces of material for humanity to learn from. What would you choose? Mm, Great question. I would say... The three things I have first would be um, my understanding human design community from Karen Curry Parker, because it's a great resource with courses on all different topics through the lens of human design. Then I would say Essentialism, the Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Greg McKeown. It was one of the first like personal development books I ever read. And it's funny now that I know human design I understand why the parts that resonated resonated so much with me because he's talking about if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. I'm like, oh, now I know that's my sacral response. If my sacral response isn't a uh uh-huh, it's an uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh. And then the second piece I got from that book was permission to say, let me get back to you. And in my design, I have that emotional solar plexus center defined where we mentioned you have it open. With it defined, I have this natural emotional wave that I need to ride out to make sure that what's an uh uh-huh for me stays an uh uh-huh over time. Because if I'm on a high of my wave and I commit to something Uh, and then I go into my low of my wave and it's like, "Mm, that doesn't really feel true for me anymore. Now I've committed to things that I don't really have the energy for. So being able to say, let me get back to you totally aligns with my emotional wave. Mm. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. And then the third one, um, which again was a personal development book I read early on, um, was You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. Um, I just love her energy and I like her like no bullshit, call it like she sees it, um, really showing up as her authentic self. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how you can pick up on energy through the written word. For sure. For sure. And I listen to audiobooks a lot too. So I think that, especially <laughs> when the author reads them. Yeah. What's the best or worst advice you've ever received? It's not personal. It's just energy. And so we can see that through human design. Um, and it just confirmed, like if you've ever read The Four Agreements, Um, One of the four agreements is it's not personal. And so really understanding that um, in certain relationships and situations, it's just an expression of that person's energy. Mm. Um, And depending on, and now being able to kind of take a step back and, and understand that 
oh, this is maybe the low expression of that energy. And, and it brings about for me more compassion for that person. Oh, that's really powerful. Tell me one thing that your tribe doesn't know about you. Probably that the kids in all of my pictures on social media aren't mine. They're my nieces. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good secret. <laughs> my sister's a teacher, so I would often go with them on their field, school field trips and that kind of stuff. So everyone in my world, even like friends, um, like acquaintances from their school would always tag me in Facebook stuff when the kids were in them. And I'm like, you know, they're not really mine, right? <laughs> uh, well, Kristen, you're a wealth of knowledge on all things human design. And it's been fun chatting and having you on the show. Thanks, Nick. This has been really fun. I really appreciate um, your time and, and being able to share this with the world. Until next time. Sounds good. Thanks. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any changes.